You might say, well, is, is what happened to Raskolnikov true? Are the stories in that book true? And the answer to that is, well, from a factual perspective, clearly they're untrue. But then if you think of Raskolnikov as the embodiment of a particular type of person who lived at that time, and the embodiment of a certain kind of ideology which had swept across Europe and really invaded Russia, and which was actually a precursor, uh, a philosophical precursor to the Russian Revolution, then Raskolnikov is more real than any one person. He's like a composite person. He's like a person whose irrelevancies have been eliminated for the purpose of relating something about the structure of the world. And so I like to think of those things as sort of meta-real. Meta-real. They're more real than real. And of course, that's what you expect people to do when they tell you about their own lives, about their own day. You don't want a factual description of every muscle twitch. You want them to distill their experiences down into the gist, which is the significance of the experience. And the significance of the experience is roughly what you can derive from listening to the experience that will change the way that you look at the world and act in the world. So it's valuable information and they can tell you a terrible story and that can be valuable because that can tell you how not to look in the world, look at the world and act in it, or they can tell you a positive story. You can derive benefit either way, which is why we also like to go watch stories about horrible psychopathic thugs. Um, you know, and, and hopefully we're learning not to be like them. Although there are additional advantages in that, you know, someone who, you might be some, say that someone who is incapable of cruelty is a higher moral being than someone who is capable of cruelty. And I would say, and this follows Jung as well, that that's incorrect and it's dangerously incorrect because if you are not capable of cruelty, you are absolutely a victim to anyone who is. And so, part of the reason that people go watch anti-heroes and villains is because there's a part of them crying out for the incorporation of the monster within them, which is what gives them strength of character and self-respect, because it's impossible to respect yourself until you grow teeth. And if you grow teeth, then you realize that you're somewhat dangerous, and, or maybe somewhat seriously dangerous, and then you might be more willing to demand that you treat yourself with respect and other people do the same thing. And so that doesn't mean that being cruel is better than not being cruel. What it means is that being able to be cruel and then not being cruel is better than not being able to be cruel. Because in the first case, you're nothing but weak and naive. And in the second case, you're dangerous, but you have it under control. And, you know, a lot of martial arts concentrate on exactly that as part of their philosophy of training. It's like, we're not training you to fight. We're training you to be peaceful and awake and avoid fights. But if you happen to have to get in one, and, and I guess the philosophy also is, is that if you're competent at fighting, that actually decreases the probability that you're going to have to fight because when someone pushes you, you'll be able to respond with confidence and with any luck, and this is certainly the case with bullies, with any luck, a reasonable show of confidence, which is very much equivalent to a show of dominance, is going to be enough to make the bully back off. And so the strength that you develop in your monstrousness is actually the best guarantee of peace. And that's partly why Jung believed that it was necessary for people to integrate their shadow and he said that was a terrible thing for people to attempt because the human shadow, <clears throat> which is all those things about yourself that you don't want to realize, reaches all the way to hell. And what he meant by that was it's through an analysis of your own shadow that you can come to understand why other people are capable, and you as well, of the sorts of terrible atrocities that characterized, let's say, the 20th century. And without that understanding, there's no possibility of bringing it under control. When you study Nazi Germany, for example, or you study the Soviet Union, particularly under Stalin, and you're asking yourself, well, what are these perpetrators like? Forget about the victims, let's talk about the perpetrators. The answer is, they're just like you. And if you don't know that, that just means that you don't know anything about people, including yourself. 
And then it also means that you have to discover why they're just like you. And believe me, that's no picnic. So that's enough to traumatize people and that's partly why they don't do it. And it's also partly why the path to enlightenment and wisdom is seldom trod upon. Because if it was all a matter of following your bliss and doing what made you happy, then everyone in the world would be a paragon of wisdom. But it's not that at all. It's, the, it's a matter of facing the thing you least want to face.